welcome to Vaughn Forest. Great to see some of you here on our campus. Let me welcome everybody joining us online. If we haven't had a chance to meet, my name's Adam, one of the pastors here. I'm glad you're here. We're wrapping up this series today. I can't believe that it's over, but if you're just jumping in for the first time, let me tell you what we've been talking about. There are some areas of our life that cause us stress. Now, that's nothing new, right? That is not new information. You don't have to come to church to find that out. What we've been talking about is how oftentimes it's in those areas that God can show up and He can actually meet us and actually move those areas to starting to become a blessing in our life. So if you've missed any of the messages, they're all posted on our website, vaughnforce.com. I'd encourage you to catch up with those at some point um, this week or this month if you can, all right? So we've got a lot to cover today. Excited to wrap up this series. But before we do that, we're going to celebrate. I'm trying to get better at this. I'm trying to get better at pausing and stopping and drawing attention to what God is up to and celebrating that. And and that's a good reminder for all of us. You know, sometimes it's just good to, we we just kind of want to keep moving forward. And God says, no, pause for a second. In the Old Testament, they would build something. They'd stack rocks on top of each other. Now, we're not going to do that, but we are going to celebrate what God has been up to in the life of our church. So July, August, and September are a pretty busy season for us as a church. A lot of people move to our area in the month of July. Many of you moved here during the month of July because you serve in our military. Thank you. We are grateful for your service and we're grateful for the opportunity to serve you while you serve all of us. Some of you moved here in the summer because maybe you wanted to get your kids um, in the Pike Road schools. I just talked to a lady on Friday. Morgan and I were up at the school and uh, she and her daughter moved here this summer from Denver. And, And I was like, wow, we used to live in Denver. So we started talking about that and people are literally moving here from all over the country because they're hearing good things. So we have a lot of people who move here during the summer and, and get it going into August. And we try really hard as a church to be welcoming and, and ask God to send us new people. So I just wanted to share with you kind of what God's been up to. And we're going to celebrate that here. Okay, so if you look at July, August, and September... These are the number of first-time guests over that three-month period of time. Now, these are the first-time guests we know about. So these are people who let us know on their cards. So there might be more, but <clears throat> excuse me, these are the ones we know of. So three months, 136 adults as first-time guests, 114 kids, 21 students. That's middle school and high school students for a total of 271 first-time guests. Now, math is not my strong suit, but I think that's an average of about 90 first-time guest per month, which we've never had a three-month period like that in the history of this church. And so that is absolutely remarkable that God is sending us that many new people in such a short amount of time. So can we just stop for a second and celebrate? Would y'all help me celebrate that, all right? Come on, you can do better than that. The 930 did better than that. There we go. All right, better. That's better. You don't got an excuse. It's the 11 o'clock service. You should be awake by now, okay? I know it was a rough day yesterday for some of y'all. It's okay, all right? But hey, you can cheer what God is up to, right, in the life of our church. Now, That's one thing to celebrate, okay? It's exciting to go, wow, like all these new people are here. But like, do they come back? In other words, are y'all nice to them? Do, do, they, do they wanna come back, right? They say, this is a place I can get connected. This is somewhere I kind of feel like it's a spiritual family or it could become a spiritual home. And I know these are a bunch of numbers and someone's a pastor, it's not about numbers. I totally agree with you. It's not about the numbers, it's about people. And each one of these numbers represents a person created in God's image that Jesus went to the cross for. So that's why we look at these, okay? So we also ask that question. It's great to see there's a lot of guests, but do they come back. And so I just said, what if we just kind of looked and tried to do a little bit of comparison, all right, from this time last year to this time this year. Those are some big stinking errors. You cannot miss those errors, okay? But from the fall of 2021 to this fall, what we did is we went back and we said, okay, what was the highest attended Sunday for each one of these areas? Because they don't always fall on the same Sunday. So you might have one Sunday where there's more adults in here, but there's fewer kids out there. It doesn't always work the same way. So we went and looked. And so last fall, the most adults we had in our 9.30 and 11 o'clock services combined on a Sunday was 399. Now I was raised Baptist, so that's 400. Okay, can I get an amen? All right, so about 400 adults, 180 kids. That's the most kids. And that's babies through fifth grade on a Sunday. 61 students, middle school and high school. And then our Spanish service, 110. That's happening right now. If you're new to Vaughn Forest, just across the lobby and the warehouse, that's what we call that other large auditorium, we have a Spanish worship service. The music is in Spanish, the preaching is in Spanish, and it's a part of our Vaughn Forest church family, okay? So that was last fall. Now, this fall, we wanted to see, again, new people are coming, but are they staying? So this is one way you can kind of gauge that. So our highest attended uh, Sunday so far in here with adults, uh, we went from 399 to 481. With kids, 
the highest Sunday was 243, which that's remarkable growth from 180 this time last year to 243 kids um, this year. That's just insane. Same thing with students. I mean, from a percentage perspective, to go from 61 to 87 is absolutely remarkable. And then look what God's doing in the Spanish service. A lot of them are meeting Jesus. They're baptizing folks. Um, pretty cool from 110 to 138. So when you look at all of that together, this time last year, we were sitting at about 750 people on our campus on average every single Sunday. And God God has us right now 200 people more at 949. That's 200 people more every single Sunday that God is bringing to us here at Vaughn Forest Church. I don't know about you, but that is worth celebrating. So would you join me in celebrating that this morning? Come on, a little better, a little better, a little better. That's more like it. That's more like it. Hey, hey, y'all, here's the thing. This is not normal. We, 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 we celebrate this for a couple of reasons. One, we want to give God all the glory, okay? Make sure everybody's on the same page with that. But two, we don't want to take this for granted. We, we don't want to just feel like we're entitled to this, okay? God is blessing our church. God is up to something. And guess what? We get to be a part of it. Isn't that incredible that we get to be a part of what God is up to? So we're going to talk about that every now and then. We're going to celebrate that. We're actually going to have a celebration Sunday in December where we won't put up numbers with big arrows. We're going to have videos and pictures and kind of tell the story of the entire year. So we're going to really celebrate for this entire last part of the year all that God has done in the life of our church. So good job celebrating that. Grab your message notes, all right? Grab your message notes. We've got a lot to cover today. We're going to jump into a passage here in just a second. But before we jump into that passage, I need to go back to our big idea. We've talked about this every single week in this series. If you're just jumping in today for the first time, you're just seeing this big idea for the first time. So the big idea for the series, moving from stressed to blessed has more to do with the internal condition of my heart than the external condition of my circumstances. For a Christ follower, this is the difference, that our outlook on life is not determined by what's going on around us. It's determined by what's happened in us, the change, the transformation brought about through Jesus Christ and salvation, okay? So for the world, if circumstances are good, life is good. If circumstances are bad, life is bad, not for the Christ follower. And that's really been our foundational thought for this series. But before we jump into our passage today, I want to extrapolate that big idea just a little further, just give a little more clarity to it. So I didn't put this in your notes, but you might want to jot this down somewhere. There is no amount of effort that will change the internal condition of your heart. I need you to see that. We just celebrated baptism at the end of the last service. We baptized two young men, two middle school boys. People would say, man, middle school boys, what do they know? They know they need Jesus, and they accepted him, and we celebrated that through their baptism, praise the Lord. And one of these young men that I baptized, his name is Stratton. He is a great kid. I coached him in basketball, and he's also playing football this year. He's not on my team. Their team beat my team. I didn't hold that against him, okay? Stratton is a great young man. And what I shared with the 930 service is that even being a great young man, the type of kid that you would want your kids to hang around, Stratton realized that's not what gets me into heaven. There's no amount of being good. There's no amount of effort that's going to change the internal condition of his heart, my heart, your heart, or anybody else's heart. There's nothing that we can do. And that is counter to what the world tells you. The world tells you, you've got it all together. Just look within. You're good enough, smart enough, and doggone it, people like you, like the old Saturday Night Live sketch, okay? But that's a lie. There's nothing you can do to change the internal condition of your heart, which is why we started this series way back on week one in John chapter three, where Jesus explained to Nicodemus that you must be born again. That's what brings about a changed heart. So let me take you back, back to a quote that I referenced way back in week one from Pastor Charles Stanley. I like how he explains this. What does it mean to be born again? It's the act of God by which he imparts eternal life to those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. So God does this. There's no amount of effort that you can do to bring about the change. So God sent Jesus God did this. God sent his son. He willingly sacrificed his own son. Jesus went to the cross. Jesus then defeated death through the resurrection. Now, why does that matter? The only person who can offer you eternal life is someone who defeated death. His name's Jesus. 
which is why he can rightly say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There are not multiple paths to God. There's one. His name is Jesus. He went to the cross for you, and he defeated death through the resurrection. So being born again starts with God initiating that process by sending Jesus. But when does it happen for you? It happens when you accept Jesus as your Savior. This must be done by faith, and it's a decision you have to make. Your grandma can't make it for you. Grandpa can't make it for you. Mom and dad can't make it for you. doesn't matter if you were raised in a Christian home, pagan home, atheistic home, or no home. Okay? You have to get to a place in your life where you recognize, I need to accept what Jesus did for me. These two young men that we baptized last service made that decision. Baptism is how they tell everybody that they've made that decision. Okay? So, so being born again is what brings about the change of a heart, the internal condition. So let me put that statement back up there and then add a clarifier. There's no amount of effort that will change the internal condition of your heart. However, living from the internal condition of your heart requires a lot of effort. And this distinction and not recognizing, understanding, cooperating with, and living from this distinction is why a lot of Christians experience stress. They don't see the distinction. They don't recognize that just because I didn't do anything to get into this relationship with God, if I'm actually now going to live that out, there's a bunch of stuff I got to do. And that's what I want to talk about today, okay? So let me give you the title of today's message and where we're going to be. If you have a Bible, Ephesians 4, if you want to go there, starting in verse 17. If you don't have a Bible, we'll put all the verses up here for you. But we're going to talk about moving from stress to blessed with my walk, Maybe you've heard this before. Someone walks with the Lord. Someone walks with God. How is your walk with the Lord going? I want to take you to the passage where this word comes from, this understanding comes from. And this word walk is a very interesting word in the New Testament. So real quick, the Bible was not written in English. The Bible was written in Greek, but not just any kind of Greek. It's called Koine Greek. That's kind of a fun word. And what that means is it's everyday street language. It wasn't written in the formal language of the academy for the educated. It was written in everyday street language. Why? The gospel has always intended to be accessible for everyone. The Bible has always, the intent has been for it to be read by everyone, not just an elite few. And when you see this Koine Greek and you kind of study it and you kind of learn it and it's interesting and there's a lot of tools that are available to you free online that you can use when your Bible study methods, okay? This word walk in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels, it, it literally means walk. Like when it says Jesus was walking, this is the word that's used. When Jesus looked at a lame person who had never walked and said, rise and walk, this is the word that's used. But when you get to Paul's letters, who's Paul? You new to the Bible? Paul wrote more books in the New Testament than anybody else inspired by the Holy Spirit. They were letters to churches. Ephesians is a letter to the church at Ephesus. When Paul uses the word walk, he doesn't use it like I'm literally walking. It's his favorite word to use what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. It's a journey. It's an onward process. So Jesus says, born again. Paul talks about being in Christ. That's Paul's favorite phrase. So there's nothing you can do to be in Christ. God does this for you. You freely accept this gift of salvation. But once that happens, now you've got to start walking with the Lord. Now you've got to start moving forward with the Lord. And the passage we're going to look at today lays out with great clarity what it looks like to walk with the Lord. And my contention for this message is for a lot of us who are Christ followers, not recognizing what it looks like to walk with the Lord and not acting accordingly might be why we're experiencing some stress in our life. So it's a long passage. I'm not going to read all 15 verses in their entirety. What I'm going to do is I've broken it down into six kind of smaller uh, chunks, if you will, all right? And we're going to have some Bible study time today. So we're going to go through these one section at a time. We're going to point out some different things about it, and then I'll give you like a principle for each of those, okay? So let's get started in verse 17 of Ephesians 4. So I say this and affirm in the Lord that you are no longer to, here's our word, walk just as the Gentiles also walk. Again, not literally walking, language used to describe how you're living your life. In fact, if you're reading from the NIV, the NIV translates that word as live. I'm reading from the New American Standard. So you're not supposed to walk as the Gentiles walk. You're not supposed to live as the Gentiles live. Now, Gentile, we clearly know that people who are Gentiles could experience salvation. We, we know that. 
Paul's using this word in this sense to describe someone who has not yet been born again. Sometimes we, we might describe these individuals as lost. G- God, Jesus said, I came to do the will of the Father to seek and save those who are lost. Sometimes we talk about those individuals who have not yet accepted Jesus as people who Jesus died for. This is what Paul's saying. There's a comparison and a contrasting, okay? You're not supposed to live like those folks. Something's happened in you, right? Affirm in the Lord that you're no longer to walk just as the Gentiles also walk. Now listen to how he begins to describe the life of someone who is lost and the futility of their minds being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. So we just saw two big phrases that I want to draw your attention to, okay? So back it up one slide. And let me point out the first one. The first phrase describing the lost is that they are darkened in their understanding. Now let's go back to the next phrase. The next phrase is hardness of their heart. Isn't that interesting? Darkness of their understanding, hardness of their heart. What are both of those things? Internal. Internal condition. Paul says, don't walk like those who are lost. And how does he describe what that looks like? Not by what it looks like by what's going on on the inside, in their thought life and in their heart. And Paul says, hey, if you're a Christ follower, that's not where your mind should be and that's not what your heart should look like. And then he gives us the reason why. And they, having become callous, have given themselves up to indecent behavior for the practices of every kind of impurity with greediness. Now, why have they given themselves up for these types of practices? Because they're lost. Darkness of their mind, because they are lost hardness of their heart. So what is Paul trying to show us right off the bat with this passage? If you're taking notes, jot this down. Walking with the Lord means that there is alignment between my actions and my identity. That's what Paul wants us to see. That if you are in Christ, you should look differently. Your walk should be differently. You should live your life differently. And and, and if I can step on some toes this morning, lovingly as your pastor. For some of you here on our campus, for some of you joining us online, your source of stress is that there's not alignment between your actions and your identity. Your source of stress is you live more like the world than you live like a Christ follower. Your source of stress is darkness of mind and hardness of heart because of your sinful behavior. And you're trying to pinpoint, what's causing me all this stress? Let me tell you what's causing the stress. You're not in alignment. See, it's not miserable to be a lost person and live like a lost person. Here's the word for that, normal. What's miserable is to have experienced salvation, have been born again, have been in Christ, and live like a lost person. Because let me tell you what's going to happen. The Holy Spirit is going to wear you out to the glory of God and make you miserable because you are not being who God says you are. Here's who God says you are. A child of his worthy of the death of his son on a cross. Live that way. And for many of us, so many times in our lives, we're wondering and we're searching and we're trying to figure out, why am I stressed? Look at your life. Why is there a hardness of heart? Look at your life. Why is my mind? Look at your life. And if you are out of alignment, repent. And let the actions of your life, the behaviors of your life, match the identity that you've been called into as a Christ follower. This is what it means to walk with the Lord. So let's pick up the passage. Let's keep going. Verse 20. But you didn't learn Christ this way. If indeed you have heard of him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former way of life, you, rid, you are to rid yourselves of the old self. This is awesome. Sin nature. So just because you've experienced salvation, been born again, found in Christ, doesn't mean you don't still have this old sin nature. You've got to rid yourself of this old sin nature, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit and that you are to be renewed in the spirit 
of your minds. Now, if you actually have your Bible in front of you, Henry, our, our first grader, was super excited this morning because he brought his Bible with him. And, and you're like, well, of course, that's what kids could do. But in our kids' ministry, they work with them to help them navigate the Bible. So if you've got kids, tell them to bring their Bible with them every single week. And a lot of us have Bibles now on digital devices. So if you've got a Bible on a digital device, you've got an old school Bible in front of you, I would encourage you to highlight this, okay? Verse 23, you are to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Here's why. This is really interesting. This word renewed, it's the only time in the entire New Testament it shows up. Only time. Now, you can find the word renewed in many places in the New Testament. But remember, we were talking about the little Greek earlier. It's the only time that that specific word in the Koine Greek is used. And it carries with it a really interesting understanding. It's not just this, yeah, I need to be renewed. It's, it, it's, it's a decision. It's, it's a stake in the ground. It's I am choosing to renew myself. It's intentional. It's not just happenstance. It's not like, well, I hope I'm going to renew. It's like, no, I am doing this. If you grew up maybe in a little uh, more of a traditional setting in church, sometimes the preacher would call folks to rededicate their lives. That's kind of where this comes from. It's a, it's a rededication. It's a renewal. Maybe you grew up in a church where someone said, some of y'all backslidden. Anybody grew up in a church that would use that phrase? You're backslidden. You need to rededicate. You need to renew. That, that, that is talking about your will. You're choosing to do this. This is what this word is saying. So, so I'm going to cast off this old self, and I'm going to choose to do something about it. But look at the very next phrase. Renewed in the spirit of your minds. Now, this is really interesting. The spirit of your minds. That word spirit is the same word used for Holy Spirit. Now, I don't want to take a shot at the NIV because I am down with the NIV. I like the NIV. I use the NIV a lot. But the reason why I'm using the New American Standard today is I don't think the NIV gets a really good translation of that word. The NIV translates it as attitude. It's not attitude. The word is spirit, and it's the same word used to describe the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. That's a lot different than you just having a good attitude. Now, why does that matter? Because if I'm going to make this decision to be renewed through the power, here we go, of the Holy Spirit, where is that going to happen? It's going to happen in my mind. So I'm gonna cast off this old self. I'm gonna choose to be renewed. I've got access to the power of the Holy Spirit. That's gonna take place in my mind and then see what, see what happens. Then I put on this new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in the righteousness and holiness of the truth. So what's the takeaway for walking with the Lord? Walking with the Lord means that there is a daily renewal of my mind and it's not casual. It's that stake in the ground every single day. And why does it matter? Because you gotta do it in your mind. That's the process we just saw. Cast off the old self, renew mind to the power of the Holy Spirit, then put on the new self to walk forward in righteousness and holiness. Church, listen, if you're a Christ follower, the battleground of your life has moved from your soul to your mind. Satan can't touch your eternity. Jesus already claimed that. So he goes after you in your mind. And if you are not daily renewing your mind, so how do I daily renew my mind? You get God's word into your mind and you drive that stake in the ground every single day and it takes effort. You have to set an alarm clock. You have to open your Bible. You've got to do something. And if you don't, you will find yourself wandering off of a path that you've been called to walk with intention on to walk with the Lord. It is a daily renewal, okay? Let's keep going in our passage. Verse 25, therefore, ridding yourselves of falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, because we are parts of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. That's pulled directly from the book of Psalms in the Old Testament. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. Some translations say a foothold. Some translations say a place. So don't be giving the devil an opportunity. Don't give him a foothold. Don't give him a place. So jot this down and we'll talk about what it means. Walking with the Lord means not giving the devil a place in my life. Like, well, hello, obviously. I'm not gonna give the devil a place in my life. I mean, I know that. I go to church. I'm not supposed to give the devil a place in my life. But when we see what this passage is saying, here's what we begin to see. Wait a second. I might be doing that. Anger gives the devil a place in your life. That's what this is saying. And anger is something that a lot of us struggle with. Anger has been something that for years I've had to take before the Lord, okay? 
Sometimes those of us who get a little wired, get a little passionate, get a little fired up, the flip side of that coin can be anger. If you, want, if you don't believe me, ask my wife and children. They will tell you the truth, okay? I'm just telling you. I'm confessing my sins. So I ain't coming down on you. But what the Lord has shown me over the years and what I am challenging you with right now is that if you don't deal with the anger in your life, you are inviting the devil to have a place in your life. And and when I read this word place this week, do you know what popped into my mind? What popped into my mind as I started thinking about place and giving someone a place as I I started thinking about my Mima. okay? Now, my Mima went to be with the Lord a few years ago, and I miss her. We were really close. And Mima was very intentional about setting uh, place settings, like for holidays. In fact, we got her Christmas china. That was one of the things that she left for us. And every Christmas, Morgan and I read diagrams and charts and do our best to kind of put all this stuff out on the table because we want to honor Mima. She was really intentional about that. And, And I appreciated that about her because I knew when I showed up to her house, that a lot of thought and detail had gone into this. And, and then I started thinking about, wait a second, I remember in the seventh grade in my middle school, they were trying to teach us how to do this. I don't know if you grew up in a school like this, but they had some notion that perhaps with this generation, we could impart that value to them. That was a terrible mistake. It didn't go well at all, but they tried really hard, okay? So my seventh grade home, ec- home economics teacher, Miss Shelton, God bless that woman, she, she taught seventh graders how to do place settings. She taught us how to cook for Pete's sake. We had biscuits and muffins and ovens, and seven, setting off smoke detectors left and right. We even, she taught us how to sew. Do, do they teach seventh graders how to sew anymore? Do they even do home economics anymore? Somebody look into that, okay? But we sewed aprons as a seventh grade kid. I wish I had kept this. I'm sure my parents burned it. I, I sewed on my apron, kissed the cook. I really did. I wore it around school. It did not work. It didn't help at all, okay? But, but like I did that. So Miss Shelton was teaching us. So it kind of got me thinking, like, do they still do that? And I Googled place setting, and I found this this week. I'm kind of excited about it, okay? This is what I'm talking about, the level of intentionality. Now, Miss Shelton did not have the red and white wine glass on her place setting, okay? And if you're a Baptist, you don't need to have there either, okay? So that's just for free, okay? But look at all this. When's the last time you sat down and had this level of detail presented before you? Now, my Mima didn't go all out with this. I mean, I never got my own pepper shaker for Pete's sake, but like, this is what I'm talking about. You're like, what on earth are you talking about? We're in church and you're putting place settings up here. I need you to track with me for a second, okay? If you struggle with anger and you don't get help and you don't do anything about it, it is the same thing as every single night taking the time to meticulously prepare your table for Satan to pull up a chair and join your family for dinner. Enter into your conversations. Be right there to hear everybody share how their day went. Listen to me. You're not inviting him to have a seat at the table of your life. You're inviting him to have a seat at the table of everybody's life around you. And if you don't do something about this anger, I need you to understand, every single time you are with people you care about, you are going through the same level of intentionality of inviting him into your life as someone who would take the time to prepare a place setting for you as an honored guest. And I don't know about you, but the last person I want to have a place as an honored guest at the table in our home is the enemy. And yet that's exactly what anger will do. You want to walk with the Lord? You got to get rid of anger. You need help? We'll help you get some help. But as long as you carry on that anger, you are inviting the enemy to have a place in your life. Let's keep going with the passage. Verse 28. The one who steals must no longer steal. Again, we're talking about walking with the Lord. But rather he must labor, producing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. What's the next thing we see from this passage? Walking with the Lord means I am now a blessing to others through my usefulness. So it means to walk with the Lord. You're useful. You're productive. You do something. And in doing that, you become a blessing. It's one of my favorite things about our church, okay? Vaughn Forest Church is not a perfect church, okay? In fact, if you're considering joining our church and you're perfect, please don't. You will ruin it for the rest of us, okay? We are not a perfect church. But what we are are people who strive to be useful. I mean, over a given week, I can't say how many people around here 
are making themselves useful. Every single Thursday, I was reminded of this just this past Thursday, there's a team of ladies that come up here on Thursdays and they put those bulletins together, like your message notes and those flyers and the pen. It doesn't print it out that way. Somebody has to put all that together and they sit around and they fellowship with one another and they do that. And they're part of our vintage adult ministry. Now, if you're new to Vaughn Forest, our vintage adult ministry is what a lot of churches call their senior adult ministry. But we call it vintage adults because our senior adults are better than yours. All right, so we call it vintage adults because I think it's cool, all right? And that name was here before I got here and I'm like, I love it, okay? So we got some vintage adults who could be doing anything they wanted to with their time on a Thursday. What are they doing? They're being useful. They're serving. It's such a blessing to walk through that East Auditorium and see them every week just being faithful, just being useful. During the 930 service, we've got people who serve with babies and preschoolers and elementary kids and middle school and high school. And during this service, all of that's happening except for the middle school and high school. They come in here during the 11 o'clock service. What are they doing? They're being useful. We've got people who go downtown every month, downtown Montgomery, to feed the homeless. What are they doing? They're being useful. We have people who serve all in the Pike Road schools, doing all kinds of different things in the schools in East Montgomery. What are they doing? They're being useful. Listen, if you aren't doing something, you're missing out on the blessing. Here is a proven formula for stress. Make your life about you. Just make your life about you. Make your time about you. Make your resources about you. Be a consumer rather than a contributor, and let me tell you what will happen. Stress. But when you serve, when you make yourself useful, we got a bunch of people to be up here on our campus tonight serving through our ESL, English as a Second Language Ministry. What are they doing? They're making themselves useful. You're like, I don't know how to make myself useful. Well, for Pete's sake, that's why we put that connection card in your bulletin every single week, okay? There's plenty of things on there. All you got to do is mark it. We will put you in the game quicker than you know what happened. You'll be running something before you know it around here, okay? You got to be useful. And if you're not being useful, you're missing out on the blessing and you're missing out on what it means to walk with the Lord, okay? Let's keep going. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but if there is any good word for edification according to the need of the moment, say it so that it will give grace to those who hear. And I'll leave this up here for a second because I really like this verse. The first part of this verse is a lot of what my mom used to tell my brother and my sister and I when we were growing up. It, It happened a lot. She would say, if you don't have something good to say, don't say anything at all. I can't tell how many times I find myself saying that to our boys, right? If you don't have something nice to say, don't say it. And for a lot of us, it's kind of like, okay, that's the standard. But that's not what this verse says. That's just part of the equation. What's the second part of the equation? If you have a good word for edification, according to the need of the moment, say it. Sometimes as Christ followers, we think sin is just making sure we don't do the bad stuff. But what does the book of James say? Hey, if you, I threw in the hay for free. Hey, if you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, to you it's a sin. Here's what this verse is saying. Yeah, keep your mouth shut if you don't have anything good to say, but if you do have something good to say, say it. Speak up. Why? Give grace to that person who needs to hear it. No one has ever said, man, I've just got way too much encouragement in my life. I am just so sick of being encouraged, okay? People never say that. Speak up. If you see something, say something, okay? So what's the principle there to jot down? Walking with the Lord means I recognize the power of my words. The Bible says your words have the power of life or death. How are you using your words? This is going to rub some of y'all the wrong way, okay? Your relationship with God just isn't about what happens in your quiet time every morning. It's about how your words are affecting those around you. That's equally as important. Yes, meet with the Lord, absolutely. But then recognize how you use your words matter. It matters, okay? I mean, parents, the way we speak to our kids matters. And listen, we're trying to raise three boys. If you knew our church, we got three boys, 13, 11, and seven. And I have to check myself. There are some times I realize my words are being used more to correct behavior than encourage things. And that's part of parenting. We have to use our words to correct behavior. But can I challenge you? As Morgan and I try to challenge each other, hey, look for good things to, to verbally point out. And I know it can be tough sometimes, right? It's hard. To, it's like something like, you put your underwear in the right drawer. Absolutely fantastic. We are thrilled about that as your parents, okay? Sometimes you gotta put the bar pretty low, all right? But find something that you can speak up about, all right? Spouses. Listen, wives, just for a second, like I am a husband, so I'm gonna speak on behalf of all the men who are husbands. 
we can be knuckleheads. We're, we're very aware of that, okay? When you point it out, it really doesn't help. That was for free, okay? But we know that we're not good at a lot of stuff, okay? So if you see us doing anything right, please tell us. We'll do more of it, okay? Like, it, we'll probably be caught off guard. Really, I did something right. This is fantastic, okay? So that didn't sound very nice. I apologize. We'll edit that out later, okay? But that's the idea. If you see us doing something good, like, just say it. Wow. Now, gentlemen, we take way too many things for granted. It's time some of us speak up a little bit more in our homes. You need to speak words of life over your wife. Well, she knows I love her. Come on, dude. Speak words of life to your wife. Our words matter. Part of walking with the Lord is recognizing the power of your words and adjusting accordingly, okay? Let's look at our last part of the passage for today. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I love this verse. It says that the Holy Spirit sealed you. So when you use an envelope and you seal it, okay, and you lick it and it tastes really bad, I think we should go back to how they used to do it with the wax that they would then put like a stamp on it to seal it. I think that's pretty cool. That's kind of the picture that we should get in our mind right now. So you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. That matters because what that means is you can't lose your salvation. Hear me. You did not earn your way into this relationship with God, so you can't send your way out of it. You have been sealed. You have been given eternal life. But just because you have been sealed and just because you've been given eternal life and just because God promises you his presence does not mean you can't grieve the Holy Spirit. So what does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit? It means to live however you want to in sin and do your own thing. And here's what God says. I love you. You're one of my children. Here's what Jesus says. I'm with you always. But here's what the Holy Spirit says. You've grieved me. And so why, why does that matter? Because when you grieve the Holy Spirit, the things that are true aren't aware to you. God's presence is still there. You're just not aware of it. Jesus has not forsaken you. You're just not aware of it. And so what's going on there? You've grieved the Holy Spirit. So you can be sealed with the Holy Spirit, yet through your actions and sinful behaviors, be grieving the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, don't do this. You're sealed for the day of redemption. And then Paul gives us a list of things that can grieve the Holy Spirit. And here's what's interesting about the list. It's all about the way we relate with one another. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander must be removed from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, compassion, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. So what's the principle here for us to walk with the Lord? Walking with the Lord means I forgive and then leave it in the Lord's hands. I believe this passage is trying to give us some insight that when there's bitterness, when we have that desire to slander, when there's malice, we're thinking about how we can get back at someone. Those are really a lot of symptoms of a much deeper issue. And here's that deeper issue, a lack of forgiveness. See, when you are wronged and someone does that to you and you choose not to forgive that person, you will become bitter. You'll want to slander them thinking that that's somehow you, how you can get back at that person. Or you'll begin to think through other ways that you can get back at them. And if you don't have a biblical understanding of forgiveness, you will allow those things to begin to eat you up from the inside out. And that will therefore determine your level of stress. It's being driven more about what's going on inside you. For the Christ follower, God says forgive. Forgive. When you forgive, it doesn't mean that you're letting them get away with anything. It means you're protecting your own heart from bitterness, slander, malice, and you're letting God handle it however he sees fit. And for many of you, the enemy is not going to get you off track with one of the big sins from one of the big categories. And I don't have to go over the categories of sins. He's just going to keep you from walking with the Lord the way that you could simply through your unforgiveness. You're carrying around unforgiveness from the past. You're carrying around unforgiveness in the present. And what the Lord says to you is forgive. Forgive release that person, leave it in my hands, walk forward 
and blessing. Would you join me as we pray together? And as you bow your head this morning, I want you to think through this passage because it, it's a convicting passage. It's one that while we read it, it reads us. And as you think about what we've looked at today, let God speak to you about what's going on in your life. And so God, as we come to you in prayer right now, we, we enter into this time of response first and foremost by saying we want it to be a time of confession. That Lord, as we look at this passage, what some of us recognize is our actions are not aligned with our identity. We want to confess that. Lord, for others of us, we have not been intentional about the renewal of our mind, and it's showing. Lord, others of us, we're carrying around bitterness. We just won't forgive that person for what they did to us. Some of us are using our words in harmful ways. Lord, some of us have just thought that walking with you is just kind of happenstance and effortless and and maybe we're recognizing that a great source of our stress has been our lack of intentionality when it comes to walking with you and cultivating that relationship with you. So, Lord, as we enter into this time of response, would you speak to your children as only a loving Father can do, revealing to us the things that you're calling us to repent from and move forward with you through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, can I invite you to stand? And as you do, join us in this time of response.